Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. And 1,000. All right, uh, just a little light reading there. Um, uh, what were we doing? Okay, Audubon Bismarck. Uh, love all you guys in Discord. Get on the Discord right now. A lot of fun, great discussions. Uh, makes it easier for me to see what you guys want me to react to and how you guys want me to tweak my channel. I always like asking advice on that. Let's get into it. We're trying to finish up some, uh, tie up some loose ends with some of these uh, series that I'm in. I want to make it more, we want to, you know, people are helping me out. I want to make it more uh, structured and, and, and stable, you know, more of a routine in terms of uh, sticking to a few uh, channels, a few series and finishing them, throwing a few individual uh, um, videos that aren't part of a series that I want to check out, like History Matters videos, stuff like that, and uh, throw those in the middle there. So trying to make it a little more organized. And so let's get into it. Once again, get in the Discord, guys, and um, let's do it. Part 5, and then we have Part 6. And then I'm going to do War of the Roses and the Admiral Yi stuff. Got stuff coming. Love for you to join. Hit the subscribe button, bell icon if you're not familiar with us or you want to learn about history love to have you pull up a chair we'll be nice let's do it original video the top description below uh, i'd recommend watching the previous episodes although we are a few episodes in that is up to you let's go i've talked enough before hey folks before we start <laughs> allow me to introduce our newest extra history artist nick he'll be taking over hey, for nick. david who is now hard at work on our new extra sci-fi series say hello Hello. Any increase in power brings an increase in enemies. But to Bismarck, enemies were as useful as friends. Sorry, guys. Any increase in power brings an increase in enemies. But to Bismarck, enemies were as useful as friends. With the defeat of Austria and the consolidation of the northern German states into one hegemony ruled by Prussia, Bismarck's eye turned to the next problem, founding Germany. But to do this, he would need- He is a pretty manipulative person, isn't he? I mean, it's a great quality when you're, when you're becoming a leader. I'm not saying on his character overall, he seems like a fascinating good man. To bring all of the southern German states under his control, he knew he couldn't simply annex them by force. He needed a unified Germany, a Germany that felt like a country, not some occupied territory under a foreign rule. And for that, the southern German states would have to come to him willingly, of their own volition. But they had always been aligned with Austria, so how could he get them to volunteer to be absorbed into Prussia? He would need an external threat, something that would make these states more afraid of other nations Russia? and see Prussia as the benevolent protector and cultural brother that they could turn to in their time of need. And what better enemy than France? Napoleon France. III, who had been willing to stand by and let Prussia pick off its neighbors back when it was a minor power, suddenly woke up and- Look at me, an American, always- <laughs> Oh, it's just ingrained in my mind. Always, always thinking of Russia when uh, we need to uh, find someone to rally against. Uh, just, you know, Russia. Realized that a power to rival France had just emerged on its border. Already upset about the fact that he hadn't gotten any territory as a bribe for staying neutral in the war between Prussians and Austrians, Napoleon was primed and ready for a conflict with Prussia. But there was a problem. Both Prussia and France needed the other one to be the aggressor. Neither wanted to risk international rebuke or the possibility of foreign intervention in their cause. But Bismarck had a plan. Bismarck always had a plan. His plan was uh -oh. wait until circumstances presented themselves that allowed him to formulate an advantageous plan. So he did. Then, when the Queen of Spain plan. was suddenly kicked out of Spain by revolutionaries, Bismarck knew it was go time. Because when a European monarch vacates their throne, there is always a multinational scramble for succession. In this case, you'd think it would be less complicated because the Spanish kicked out their monarch and were essentially choosing a new one for themselves instead of trying to untangle and war over some Byzantine genealogical tree. But no, they instead decided to offer the crown of Spain to a German prince. Bismarck was all for... Do European royals trace back to the Byzantines? Or is... ...for this. ...decided to offer the crown of Spain to a German prince. 
Bismarck was all for this. He pushed for Prince Leopold to accept the offer, despite the fact that his name didn't even have Wilhelm in it anywhere. He knew full well that Napoleon III would have to rage against this offer. After all, if Spain ever allied with Prussia, which would be far more likely with a Prussian prince on the Spanish throne, France would be surrounded. King Wilhelm was against this, and even Prince Leopold didn't see great prospects in being- So what has happened since the uh, end of the Napoleonic Wars when uh, there was all that guerrilla warfare in- I don't want to always tie in two different channels that I've watched, but I'd like to learn about what happened in between the end of the Napoleonic Wars and now concerning Spain king of a country that had against this, and even Prince Leopold didn't see great prospects in being king of a country that had spent most of the last century in revolt, but Bismarck's diplomacy prevailed, and the offer was accepted. All of these dealings were kept a very close secret, though. If France found out too early, the consequences could be disastrous. What Bismarck needed was for Leopold to be proclaimed king by the legitimate assembly of the people of Spain before Napoleon could make a move. That way, if France declared war over it, the world would see them as the aggressors. Everything went perfectly. On June 19th, 1870, Leopold agreed to accept the throne. Two days later, he sent a coded telegraph to Madrid saying that he would arrive around the 29th. But then history turned, as it so often does, on a small thing. A cipher clerk made an error in decoding the message and wrote the 9th of July. The Spanish legislature couldn't be held in session that long and wrote the does on he would arrive at the throne around the 29th. But then history in oh, decoding God. the message. Imagine how much of a pain that could cause, like how much trouble that could cause in a time where obviously messaging is so more complicated and, and convoluted and difficult. Just how much that could change everything uh oh, fire that guy and wrote the 9th of july no the give Spanish him another chance. legislature couldn't be held in session that long and thus was dismissed on june 23rd which meant that when leopold arrived in spain there was nobody present to make him king people started noticing this prussian prince kicking around in madrid fairly quickly and word reached the french papers soon all of france was up in arms so not everything went perfectly but Bismarck oh, now God. played the spider, waiting silently. He <laughs> knew that he couldn't be seen directing affairs. All he had to do was wait for the French to offer some insult, and then pounce on that to have the war he wanted. But he didn't factor in Wilhelm. The king had always on, been a All he had to do was waiting silently. He knew that he couldn't be seen directing affairs. All he had to do was wait for the French to offer some insult, and then pounce on that to have the war he wanted. But he didn't factor in Wilhelm. The king had always been opposed to the prince running off and taking the Spanish throne, so when the French outcry flared up, the Prussian monarch put his foot down and told Leopold to withdraw his nomination. This was a huge diplomatic win for France, but like always, Napoleon III pushed it too far. He sent a diplomat to ask Wilhelm to swear that no Hohenzollern would ever sit on the Spanish throne. The king found this mildly insulting, as there was no way he would promise something like that in perpetuity. And besides, he had already pulled Leopold from the throne, and it wasn't likely to come up again. He felt that he had already been perfectly reasonable about this. So he replied that he could promise no such thing, and sent the French ambassador away. Then he had a quick telegram sent to Bismarck relaying the incident and granting him permission to inform the press. But Bismarck always had a way with vague instructions, and with words. He did indeed inform the press, but the message he passed along to them was carefully edited. It wasn't false, per se. It wasn't even really a misrepresentation, he just omitted some words omitted some words in such a brilliant way that when the German people read it, they would think the French ambassador had insulted their king. And when the French read it, they would think that the Prussian king had insulted their ambassador. That did the trick. This guy is a, is so good at manipulation that it is admirable. Trick. <laughs> the people were up in arms and the French were taken. He's just looking like, like, uh, like a f one kind of zoom out from everyone else like everyone else is kind of looking a little tunnel vision a little and then it just seems like he's looking at the big picture and just knows how to manipulate paris all the more so because coincidentally the telegram happened to come out on bastille day 
and Napoleon III needed a war. His regime was largely unsuccessful, and his foreign entanglements had been a disaster. He thought that if he could crush Prussia and gain territory for France, he would be back on stable footing. Soon, hundreds of thousands of French troops were pouring across the Prussian border. Bismarck had his defensive war. The French had invaded, and he had the moral high ground. In response, the southern German states flocked to the Prussian banner. But he played a dangerous game. By letting the French invade the Prussians, he had allowed them to mobilize first. Now the German army had to get into position before their country was overrun. But here, Bismarck had the greatest weapon, Moltke. The French had better rifles than the Germans, but the Germans had better ideas about modern war. Prussian mm. observers had studied the American Civil War and knew that a train schedule could be as powerful a tool as any gun. Mer. Moltke embraced the idea of the railroad and the telegraph. With coordination and these new technologies for movement, he not only got the German army to the front in time, he got more men there than the French did. But he did more than just this. He rewrote the rules so that German units no longer simply marched in great columns and fought in great lines, but rather acted as small units less susceptible to fire. Wow, he was ahead of his time. Fire. He pushed the idea that, since piercing the center of an army was no longer as much of a concern due to the deadly nature of modern rifles, they should worry less about artillery getting overrun and more about how effective it was in a fight. So he moved his artillery closer to the action and had them working in conjunction with his units. He had a general staff, the only one in Europe, whose sole purpose was to draw up war plans in peacetime and think through all of the probable scenarios of coming conflicts. With these advantages and a superiority in numbers, Moltke immediately took the offensive, rapidly pushing the French back across the border and charging into French territory. Time and again, the French reeled before the Prussian forces. Soon, the French armies were falling back, trying to link up with reserves further down the line. But the retreating army was spotted by a small cavalry brigade, and nearby Prussian forces were ordered to move in and cut them off. Unfortunately, due to some wild miscalculations by both sides, the Prussians had just sent 30,000 men to engage what turned out to be 130,000. The French were beleaguered and demoralized, but had an overwhelming advantage in men. The Prussians were ready for the fight, but ended up pinned by the French artillery. In desperation, the Prussian commander sent a message to a nearby cavalry commander, saying that the artillery must be cleared. Famously, the cavalry commander said, it will cost what it will cost, and readied his men. Obscured by the terrain, they burst through the cannon smoke at the last minute, bearing down on the foe, giving them only a thousand meters to react. The cavalry crashed into the artillery and tore through it, silencing the batteries that had so long hampered the Prussian army. This is arguably the last cavalry charge to significantly change the course of a battle in modern military history. But even a thousand meters is a long ride when you've got modern guns firing at you. Of the 800 horsemen who set out, only 420 made it back. And it turns out that Bismarck's son was among this regiment. It was late in the night of August 16, 1870, when a messenger arrived to tell Bismarck his eldest son was dead. Quartered only 20 miles away from the battlefield, Bismarck rode like a man possessed to find the body of his son, only to be greeted by his very much alive son laughing and joking in a farmhouse nearby. He had taken a bullet to the leg and would be out of the fighting, but was in no mortal danger. After a few more hard-fought victories, the Prussian forces bottled up the French at- What was the sort of like gangrene, gangrene, gangrene? You know, like a uh, fatality from an infected wound. Wonder how often that was. Obviously depends on a wound, an amputation might have more of a chance than, you know, a flesh wound from a bullet, obviously, but uh, yeah. At Metz and forced the surrender of 140,000 men. The French only had one army left to them, an army battered by an attempt to relieve the forces at Metz. But Moltke had no intention of letting this force get away. And in the days following the surrender at Metz, he maneuvered his forces and encircled this final army. A breakout attempt was made, but so exhausted and undersupplied were the French at this point, it soon became clear that a breakout was impossible. By the next day, a hundred thousand men, and with them the greatest prize of all, Napoleon III, who was personally leading this army, surrendered. France no longer had a real army on the field. Now it was time to think about the future. For Bismarck... How dare you call yourself Napoleon? No, I'm... That meant peace terms. For Moltke, that meant pushing on to Paris.
Wake up. The thrill is calling. This summer, answer it. At Next episode is going to be interesting. Army on the field. Now it was time to think about the future. For Bismarck, that meant peace terms. For Moltke, that meant pushing on to Paris. Interesting. There's this weird kind of um, awkward, I guess, term. Uh, just, just this weird moment in terms of uh, like the larger scale, uh, the war, not the individual battles, where people are just trying to get back in to either crush your, the enemy that's on the run, or the other hand, get a win so that you can have peace talks. Always a common theme, and the more you think about it, the more that makes sense. Get ready for the next one, last one of the, uh, I believe is the last episode of the Bismarck. Also going to get into finishing the Admiral Yi stuff and the War of the Roses, and then get right into Caesar once again and get going with that. Join the Discord, guys. Hit the subscribe button, like button, bell icon, all that. See you guys later. Hope you're doing well.